with a fan, shoot the breeze, discourse, dialogue. Bring to light to be revealed with eloquence, forever flowing fearless. How you doing? We're back. We've got another uh, another uh, episode of Fearless, and um, we're super super excited to um, have Casey Sheehan on the show and his wife Tara. Did I say that right? You did. His wife, Tara Sheehan. Tara. Um, did I say that right? Who you did. we didn't really um, <laughs> expect to have on the show, <laughs> and then um, we started chatting the before show, the show, and, and I said, "You got to be on the show because I know Casey already, and because I know Casey, you know, obviously <laughs> already, and something behind this, this right? <laughs> but uh, <laughs> maybe not. But, <laughs> but we're but uh, <laughs> we're we're but we're really excited, and and I've noticed, you know, in the Twitterverse, we call it the Twitterverse. There's been a lot of lot of other people that were excited about you. There's been a lot of a lot of other people that were excited about you, and I think it's because. Because Patagonia, I think it's because is seen as something that's really important to a lot of people that live in the corporate world. Because you have done things and you have piloted a way of being um, that is kind of precious. And there's not a lot of examples. It's kind of precious. I think people feel a lot of examples. I personally feel it. I'm thankful for the work that you're doing. I personally feel Yvonne is thankful for the work that you're doing. And so how did you, let's start with how you got this gig. Because it's also, I think people are just jealous. Like, this is the best job in the world. It's certainly the best job in the outdoor industry. But it's, you know, the company's becoming more uh, uh, extensive than that. But I, I had known Yvonne Chenard since I was a little kid. We used to go fly fishing together up in Wyoming. And we both had places across the river from one another in Jackson Hole. And, so it's uh, nepotism. So yeah, it's yeah. nepotism. Okay. Yeah. Excellent. So about six years ago, he called me and said, would you be interested in coming to run our fly fishing division mm -hmm. and paddle sports and doing some new business development? And I said, sign me up. Let's go. So I met him in Ventura. Uh, was living in Colorado at the time and came into you know, Patagonia for about six months. And then the previous CEO suddenly left the job. And Yvonne asked me if I would take over as Where'd CEO. Where did the previous CEO go? He went to uh, a, a company called Revolution Living, which was you know, involved in various spas and resorts and, and things like that. So anyway, that's how it started, and it's, been, it's almost been five and a half years since then. And, um, and you were in Colorado at the time, and now how are Still you Still living in Colorado on weekends and commuting back and forth. Not given up the Colorado thing. I haven't given up. Tara grew up in Breckenridge, so it's kind of tough, and my boys are real mountain kids. They uh, yeah. wanted to stay. I have one going to see you and another in this last year in high school, and yeah. he's a professional slope style skier. And of course, being in Colorado is the place for him. And, and we'll, we'll get into like real nitty gritty kind of stuff, but how did you get into the outdoor industry? And maybe um, how does one who wants to get into the outdoor industry get into it? Well, I always say just follow your passion and you'll go wherever you're meant to go. And I, I was the editor and publisher of Powder Magazine, a ski magazine. So I was in the ski industry, then the sporting goods industry, worked at Nike for four years, became VP of marketing for Merrill Footwear. That's mm -hmm. where you and I worked together on an at. ad campaign, which was kind of a cross between Mardi Gras and, and, and you know, electric Kool-Aid acid tests. <laughs> Typical Crispin Porter Boguski we work. We were working on our style. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And then uh, was, became the president of Kelty here in Boulder. And, and then that was when the opportunity presented itself for Patagonia. So it's sort of the heart of the outdoor but you didn't, industry. Your first job was an editor of Powder Magazine. Or maybe it was. Well, I was a journalist and a carpenter and a ski bum and a trout bum and okay. kind of pulling it all together. And, and then that turned into a full-time job. Did you go to school for journalism? I was an American Studies major at Stanford. So I was like studying communications, poli sci, history, everything mm -hmm. kind of fed into the major. Mm -hmm. I just kind of lucked into it. I mean, a lot of, I, there's a lot of young people, I think, that watch the show and, and, they, and they worry about their career. Like, you know, how do I take this from school and what I'm learning and turn that into a job? Mm -hmm. And I think people look at it as a very one-to-one -one thing. It's, it's not. It's not. Just follow what you like to do and something will turn up that you like and, and yeah. just keep just heading towards those things that, you know, really connect with your heart. That, those would be the best jobs. It's so hard for people to do that, though. Like, you know, it's obviously worked for you. I kind of feel like it's worked for me. It's worked for a lot of other people who tend to, you know, be able to, they, they integrate what they do into who they are, and it's fun, right? Mm -hmm. It suddenly stops being work. But 
you know, there are those moments where you've got to be nervous. Like, I don't know if this makes total sense, but it's where my heart is. How do you work through those? I mean, well, I, I just, if you find the right job, it's the kind of job where you're going to leap up the stairs two at a time to yeah. go see what business adventure awaits to every day. That's the right job. Right. And literally, your, your coworkers are your friends. And everything you do every day hopefully has some higher purpose to it that, that really sustains you on a deeper emotional, intellectual, and spiritual level. What if you're in the wrong job right now? You'll know it pretty fast. And you do know it. You do know it with that. And then what do you do? I just, you these quit. are the people that. You quit, quit and go fly fishing. Or climbing. Yeah. Or river rafting. Or go skiing. do the thing that you like to do. Sure. Yeah. What Life's if you too like short. You can't, what if you feel like you can't it's afford it? It all has to be enjoyed right here, right now. Not tomorrow, not yesterday. Yeah. Right now. Yeah. That's you why have, you're here, cowboy. You have a, you have a very. <laughs> this is a show about you, though. You have a, you have a very different attitude, probably, than most CEOs in America. I'm happy, and I love the people I work with. I love my wife. I love my family, and I feel connected and supported by that. Yeah. And I think when when I'm happy, the board is happy, my employees are happy, our customers are happy. They're spreading that happy in in which we talked about with Patagonia. What's happening right now? is our tribe is getting bigger. A lot of people want to be part of a company that's very purpose-driven. Mm -hmm. You know, our, our mission statement says we're about inspiring and implementing solutions to the environmental crisis. And that's, that's fun. That's hard work, but it's fun work. It's not like we're here to... But that's to... very different than jackets. Like, that's I right. think a lot of people who make jackets and stuff would be hard-pressed to say our mission... But the, well, there's nothing in like the mission that. statement about, you know, increasing shareholder, you know, return on investment. Right. Or, or all the traditional things. But it's, it's, but it's working. I think someone's your mom's at, calling. Yeah, someone's at the door. Hold on. This does happen. Oh. So we're doing the show right now. Can you go around the back? I love that. So it's fun. This you know, is so live grassroots. Audience, we don't really have a lot of crowd <laughs> control. Um, uh, but people were excited enough that we you know, had another live audience, and that's, that's fun. Shows the draw of Patagonia, actually. So yeah, go on. Like, this is, it's bigger than Patagonia, right? Oh, it's bigger than Patagonia, and, and you sort of, to go further than that, so the, the, the passion and the values does all kind of connect the whole tribe of people, but um, you also see when things are, are really firing that the company's kind of operating as one mind, including our, our customers. And I caught that, yes, yeah, the Buddhist concept of one mind, but it's also this collective consciousness. And I, when I talk about our management style as a company, I always I put a PowerPoint slide up in the screen geese flying in, in formation. Mm -hmm. And the leaders you know, are always out in front. Those are the ones with vision. It's always been Yvonne. Yvonne has had the strongest vision about what this, this kind of socially, environmentally responsible company could be. And he's flying out in the front. But sometimes Yvonne's tired, his wings get tired, so he kind of falls to the back and then another leader emerges. Maybe it's me mm -hmm. or one of my other senior managers who's got great ideas and great plan. We all kind of fly behind him, and, but we're all going to the same place. Right. And like a school of fish or like a flock of birds, we, we tend to think collectively in a similar path, and we make decisions together. So it's a little bit slow moving, but it's very creative, as yeah. opposed to a hierarchical organization, a militaristic style of organization where decision making is slow, and it's like, okay, the boss says we're doing this, okay, everybody march over here for yeah. a while. Begin to implement it. Doesn't feel right. Not, nothing really that exciting comes out of an organization like that, except that you, uh, you know, go into Afghanistan and think you're gonna win a war. Well, guess what? It doesn't work. And you, and you don't have a mission, which is quarterly returns. It's not part of your mission. Yet you achieve great success. We're as, having as the company, three right? of the best years we've ever had, right in the middle of the global, a global economic crisis. Yeah. And um, I, it's hard to know why that is, but I think people are, are making more um, considerate, thoughtful purchases, mm -hmm. looking for durability, looking for high quality. <clears throat> that is helping us right now. Um, you know keep our yeah. sales at a very good level in our, in our, in our profitability. So um, we think we're going to come out of this recession in a very strong position, taking market share from the obvious guys in the outdoor industry. So a lot of people probably come up to you and they say, I want to work at Patagonia, right? I'm going to ask you later if I can get a job. Maybe. Right. Get in line. We, we, yeah. ha we have in a, line. Exactly. We have a thousand applicants for every job. Right. People so want, much want to be a part of I this deal. I mean, wouldn't deal. every company on earth want to have that? I mean, that's another yeah. benefit of being so mission driven. But it's impossible, and this is bigger than Patagonia, and it kind of brings up some of the work that, that uh, Tara's doing. Mm -hmm. Do, can you describe that? Because what if I can't, because I, I think that is a reflex. I want to work there. But mm -hmm. that's not really the answer for everybody. So how do you take 
what's being piloted at Patagonia and move it into other organizations. Yeah. Well, we both started it. It's called Conscious Global Leadership. And that was what was happening is Casey would do these talks. He'd give a PowerPoint, and then people would start lining up and saying, I want to work for you. Right. And I want to leave my company. And so we decided that we need to help create a model for a great company and look at how Casey, you know, how he's helped to transform the company by really looking at himself. And that's kind of what we talk about in Conscious Global Leadership is that you have to have a practice of inner awareness because however I am, when I go into my job is how, you know, what's, what is going to affect everybody. So mm -hmm. if I'm in a grumpy mood and I'm negative, then it affects, you know, it's like ripples in the pond. It's going to, it's going to go outward. And if I really practice this inner awareness and come to my job from passion and purpose, and that's, that's how I feel with the people I'm relating to, then it just ripples out, and you mm -hmm. see the best in everyone. So, um, so, and then in that place where you, you, you start to think and really um, listen to, uh, what do I really love? Where do I, like Casey says, you know, run up the stairs two at a time. What is that? Because, you know, we kind of believe you can create anything. Mm -hmm. So why not create a job around what your passion is? And with, if more companies would look at the model of, of Patagonia, then you'd... you'd you wouldn't have these lines out the door when he's when he's talking. You'd right. see other companies saying, "What's your model? Let me learn from you. Let me come and just you know walk around your company and see what you're doing right, so that other people want to go to work, and they blur the lines between work and lifestyle." So that's and you've kind done of this how. with companies like like Walmart or like. Well, we worked with Walmart specifically on helping them kind of reduce their overall footprint, mm -hmm. and and um, it, it's everything from looking at helping them look at their packaging, looking at their their, their sourcing. I'm really aware of the of what Walmart's mm -hmm. been doing, and it's amazing. But I didn't realize there was a Patagonia Walmart connection. Well, they came. They their uh, top brass came to Ventura and met with Yvonne and I and a number of our you know uh, environmental uh, people about two years ago and then there were a series of meetings since that are leading to some very groundbreaking work in terms of developing a, a really robust eco index and of course I, yeah. I mentioned the packaging side but but Walmart is um, smart enough to see that there are these susta sustainability gains that they're making will be will lead to greater profitability right. as well and greater efficiencies and so there's a little bit of enlightened self-interest in what they're what they're going about right now but we're happy to help them I mean we yeah. would help Exxon and you know Royal Dutch Shell, anybody, these big companies. Exxon watches the show, so. Yeah. 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 Exxon, we're here to help. Call, call we're here to help. Yeah. yeah, he's here. We need your money to help solve the environmental crisis. But yeah. seriously, these, these, these kinds of big companies are ones that can really move the meter. Well, there, there's, there's something that relates to, to your work, too, um, which is the, the cognitive dissonance that gets created when we do a job that doesn't really align with our values. And... We don't have a way and a compassionate and a sympathetic way to move through that, right? Um, and in your corporate culture, and you, you say it's not a corporate culture, but let's say that it is the most important or one of the most important corporate cultures to, to sort of pilot. Um, there, Yvonne is very critical of things that you do publicly, mm -hmm. right? And I've read things where you are concerned with certain aspects of things that you do publicly. That is not allowed in most companies. Well, the, you, you know, um, my flying here on an airplane, uh, driving here in you know, our car, I mean, it, we are making choices constantly. And making apparel is a dirty and business. And you clear cut the park right before the show. not to. We, we did <laughs> shoo the, the deer and the animals out of the way. Very though. surprising. Yeah, I know. <laughs> um, <laughs> we, make, we have to make these choices, and they're, they're, they're constant, and, and I think we need to bring transparency and visibility to them mm -hmm. all the time so that we know exactly what we're doing, so, because in that you will find better ways. Yeah. And I remember you know, when we started the Footprint Chronicles, which is our online CSR report. I'm going to pull that up right now. I talked to uh, Hunter Lovins, who's the head of the Natural Capitalist Group. She's been here. on the show. Yeah, Hunter, and I sat in my mm -hmm. office after she'd made this wonderful presentation, I said, Hunter, we are about to go broadly transparent with video, with streaming, with you know, uh, soundtrack, with you know, everything. Right, we're going right into the factories and show how we make stuff. And we're going to show the impact of every single garment. And we're starting with 150 just garments. Into that real quick so people can see and that. I said, Hunter, I'm really nervous about this because we've always been a lead and share kind of company and we're okay with doing this and then 
helping others come to this realization and maybe adopt some of these better business practices. Yeah. He said, well, should I do this? I said, we're not even really ready. It's like we're going to open the kimono, and yeah. I feel like I don't know what's going to happen. Are we going to get vulnerable. I felt like I was going to get filleted. Yeah. But, but she calmed me down and said, you know, you've just got to go for it. Mm. Rip the Band-Aid off, do it right now, and you'll, you'll fine-tune the delivery of this over time. Yeah. Well, she was right. And we, we, we flipped a switch. People looked at it and said, well, there goes Patagonia leading again on, on you know, telling their story and, and, and just showing the world you know, the impact of what they do. But be, just being honest about it, we're dirty. We're, yeah. we're, everything, we, everything we make pollutes. <laughs> uh, there is no such thing as a sustainable company. We're just doing the best we can. So I felt that that was a good step to share with others and to learn from the engineers, the, the biologists, the, you know, the efficiency experts and manufacturers out there and get information from them about how to do this better. And we mm -hmm. did get a lot of that input. Yeah. Well, you asked, though. Yeah. I mean, there were a couple of things that you did right, in my opinion, in post-analysis, and this is easier than actually doing it. It's just to say, hmm, I think that they did it right because of this. But I think that you chose... Um, to, to one, find not the thing that you wanted to make transparent, but the thing that you least probably felt comfortable making transparent, the worst news. Mm -hmm. mm. And I think a lot of people approach transparency from, what can we make transparent today because it's not that bad? And what do we need to kind of put over here? I think mm -hmm. the reverse is the proper process, mm -hmm. yeah. right? Find the nastiest thing, bring it forward. <coughs> and then the other thing that you did that I thought was, was brilliant is you said, Here's our path. Here's what we hope to do. We need your help, and we're open to it. And and it isn't really good news. Well, the first time I went to it, I thought, wow, like a, it makes that many, like why don't you probably remember like how many pounds of carbon is a Patagonia T-shirt? It was a lot. It's not just the the, the yeah, carbon, but you know, water, the cultivation of cotton, the the water stress index around making cotton. And this is no surprise that cotton is becoming the most expensive fabric yarn available right now. Is that it uses 650 liters of water just to make a woman's medium T-shirt. Mm -hmm. And it, we're and these T-shirts are being built in places around the world, specifically uh, China and in, in, you know interior China, where the water stress index is already high because yeah. they've got billions of people living there. Look at India. Look at mm -hmm. you know these parts of of, uh, of Afghanistan and other places where in Turkey. So. So it's not just the water. It was, you know, it was water, but that was a, a big part and of it. And it's not it. just carbon, but it's, yeah. Yeah, but it's funny because when we look, started, we opened up the, the Footprint Chronicles, I thought, boy, we're going to get really nailed on just this transportation aspect. Mm -hmm. You know, putting stuff into containers and, God forbid, having to ship it at faster on an airplane, which you really try not to do. Mm -hmm. But that portion of it, the, the transportation on boats from a, Southeast Asia was only 1% of the footprint, one to two at the most. Mm -hmm. So we had all these thoughts, boy, because we started moving our factory base back to Central America and to South America and, and trying to solidify and shore up some of our manufacturing, even in, in California and places like that. Um, but that wasn't, you know, it wasn't, the, it wasn't having as much of an impact. Yeah. So. Why don't you just make everything in the U.S.? We, we've tried, right, and we do some quick turn manufacturing in Southern California and on the border, mm -hmm. but it only amounts to about 13%. Um, there is more manufacturing going on in Central America and South America, especially from goods like, if, you know, our, our Polar Tech fleece is made in Massachusetts, and that can be brought over the border in, you know, CAFTA and, or NAFTA uh, exchanges and also in Canada, too. And, and more of it is being brought there. Um, but it's still the, the cost of labor, you know, there are issues there with what's going on in Asia. And it's, it's a very complex it is issue. complicated because, you, you know, you, you benefit from lower <coughs> labor, but you wind up in markets where, I mean, in the U.S., you know, we, we have labor standards and we have, you know, EPA standards and, and it makes things more expensive to produce. Mm -hmm. you, you take advantage of lower cost production. How do, you, how do you keep from being predatory? I mean, there must be a process you go through. <coughs> well, the, the first thing we're them. looking for is the, the highest quality stitching facilities because of our brand position. So, mm -hmm. you know, we don't have that same fine needle stitching capability in the U.S. anymore. We can do some things, but they have to be kind of singular tasks on over and over and over again. In Asia, you have a lot more just ability to adapt and to sew in circles and do, you know, very, very nice fitted garments. Mm -hmm. And we've lost a, a little of that in the U.S. And I'm not saying it won't come back, yeah. but when or it does... Or you couldn't bring it back. I exactly. Guess, right? yeah. yeah. 
So it's a, it's a complex situation. But how, but how do you, um, how do you figure uh, exactly what to pay somebody? You go into another market, it's not, it's not the same market. It, you know, the, the, uh, the, the standards of living are different. You want to provide a comparable wage, I'm guessing. Yes. How do you That's measure this? Well, we work very closely with the, the Fair Labor Association and all these markets to make sure, and they help us evaluate and audit every one of these facilities mm -hmm. to make sure that there, there are uh, fair wages, there are comfortable living conditions, there's, there's good food. Um, all those things have to be standard. And then the factory itself has to be you know, at the highest level. At the, you know, the workstations have to be at the right level. Mm -hmm. you know, we don't want people stooping down every single day into, into boxes and hurting their backs. Yeah. We, I've um, seen pictures <coughs> of, the, of some of the factories. Well, this is <laughs> some. Well, we just we're, we're working with a couple. I'm very <coughs> proud of um, the work we're doing with a, a group called Young One, which is in North Vietnam. Um, I'm not Young One. I'm sorry. It's uh, Maxport. Gonna, Maxport. I'm going to look and see if we have pictures of that. It is. Um, you know, mo your 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 perception or your thought about a, a you know a Chinese factory is a dark gray concrete dingy building with mm. poor lighting. This building in Vietnam, the Maxport built, and they built a series of them, and they're our highest quality manufacturing partner right now. They took out all the walls, and they put up these big sheets of glass. They planted these jungle forests in between each of the buildings with walkways in between them, and it is the most wonderful working. It's like working in the Garden of Eden, mm -hmm. and it's you know strict attention to the the sewing tables and the height. You know, based on on you know whether they're male and female sewers in in the facility, and it, and it's a yeah that it? that's mm -hmm. it that's yeah. it's hard to see you can kind of see it's the a little hard to see but we'll, we'll zoom on in the edges look. there you can see the edges of the building and you can see that beautiful you know Vietnamese jungle light mm -hmm. green light coming into the building and it's very open and airy and you know air conditioned and so that factory is producing a tremendous it amount looks of product like CPB actually. I don't know that factory, but yeah. this one. No, that's Crispin. Oh, <laughs> it probably looks better than Crispin. It does look a little. Actually, the, yeah, there's definitely more light. <laughs> but that factory's producing for 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 Nike and for for North Face and Patagonia and others, and and uh, very profitable and having a great great success finding good workers to come yeah. work there from all over the province. There's a, a video in in Casey when he does his PowerPoint and this woman in that factory she it, it's really moving because she said I make these products from my heart because you know I have passion to do this and it's because she can work in a place like that mm -hmm. and the the um, gentleman that started that Maxport you listen to him talk and he sees people not as a mechanistic product but he sees them as his most valuable resource and I think that that's yeah, like, Jeff, Jeff Stokes is the yeah. owner. He says, you know, you can't make a I Ferrari. I call people resource, though. That always makes me well, uncomfortable. What I, mean I say is, it, too. I know you what mean. I mean. Human is capital, the most, human resource. The most, Oof. It, well, it's yeah. not. The, what <laughs> I'm, the I guess what I mean is, is the it, relationship with that person, my yeah. relationship with that person, is my most valuable thing. So it doesn't matter if they make a great product. It's if they're happy. Mm -hmm. And I've actually, you know, there's, it's the meaning in the relationship, mm -hmm. you know, and the, that you're seeing the good in everybody well, and you ask how you can. I mean, it sounds in some ways like you're able to recruit the best sewers because you make, because you have the best working conditions and same, in the same way where you go speak, everyone, every MBA wants to go work at Patagonia with every, every brilliant MBA, I'm sure. Yeah, and, Let, and oh, go ahead. I just want to talk about 1% for the planet and, and what you guys do there. Well, 1% was started in the early 2000s by, by uh, Craig Matthews, who runs Blue, Blue Ribbon Flies up in West Yellowstone, Montana, and Yvonne. And this, the goal was to take Patagonia's traditional, we give 1% of our sales every year to these small grassroots environmental causes, to take this more mainstream, to encourage other companies, both public and private, to also donate 1% of their revenues towards towards these causes and, mm -hmm. and to have a process of vetting who those grassroots groups would be, uh, formalize and, and, and like a, you know, a, a good housekeeping seal of approval, have this ability to put the 1% logo on product, on mm -hmm. their stores, et cetera. It's taken off. I mean, they, they're now, uh, I think there's 2,500 or more companies that are 1% members yeah, and there it's were a in ton. 13 like we countries. No. Yeah, we were just checking how many country, or companies started with B, and there was like 800 companies that start with B or something. Right. Like that. Yeah, a tremendous amount of companies on there. Mm -hmm. So can anybody be a part of that? Anybody can, can apply and become a, a member, and then uh, Terry Kellogg, who heads up the organization, will 
help you know guide you towards groups that you can donate to and set you up. It's very easy. So, so the um, the uh, you know one of the questions when you when you look at one percent, I guess for me is just sort of why not two percent? Why not five percent? Why not a hundred percent? There you go. <laughs> why why we're at it? I, well, there's probably a reason though. For, it's, it's just terrifying for a public company mm -hmm. to lose 1% of their revenues, which I don't quite understand because it doesn't really translate that greatly down to the bottom line, but it, it's just a big deal yeah. to lose a dime if you're a, a, a public company. But we're starting to get some divisions of public companies involved, and I think we'll see more over time because the, the paradigm's changing. If you don't stand for something, you stand for nothing. Mm -hmm. So this is a good way for, for companies to, you know, to at least you know, take that first step. Well, what we talk a lot about here is empowered consumers, right? And, <coughs> and the notion that uh, if, if consumers can make really brilliant choices, if they truly could vote with their dollars and know what they're voting for, that's transformative. It's difficult because we don't really have a clear picture. Through transparency, we're gaining that ability to actually see what we're voting for. And I think that's why people are <coughs> voting for Patagonia. They're, they, they know what you're getting. It's not all good news, but I know what the exchange is. I, I would agree with that, that, that that's sort of driven some of the success we've had as a company. I know there was a survey done about three years ago now that talked about um, would you buy a product from a company that gave back to a good cause? Mm -hmm. and that was like 2008. And then the survey was done last year where the number went up from 52% of people would, you know, would purchase product from a company that gave back to a good cause. Mm -hmm. The number went from 52 to 68% in those two years. So I think that the environmental positioning, companies that have an environmental positioning, a social positioning, and even companies that are you know, encouraging personal growth within their, their workforce are being rewarded for that right now. And we've seen yeah. it in three years. Um, we've had the best three years in our company's history from a sales and from a net income standpoint, and the year we're in right now is going to outdistance all of them. Do you think that? Do you think that that going forward, as there's more information out there, people are making more informed choices that they'll actually uh, begin to potentially punish companies that aren't transparent? I mean, is transparency mm -hmm. just a good tactic right now? It's the it's the tactic. I mean, it, it's it's certainly. Um, if I looked at how Toyota might have handled themselves through their little you know, situation here in the last year and the damage this has done to their brand mm -hmm. and their reputation, they could have handled this so much more openly and, and proactively. I think it would have been a different situation. But for now, their, their rankings in J.D. Power have fallen. They're, you know, they've really hammered themselves. And this was, for, for American consumers, this was the reliable quality yeah. vehicle at a good price. It was and now good. people are terrified that the, you know, the thing's going to go hurtling off a cliff or the gas pedal's going to get stuck to the bottom. So, and, they, yeah. and they played, it seems like, they played by the rules, but they had the wrong rule book. They yeah. had the old rule book still. There are no rules around transparency. You've just got to just be honest and be open and just, it, from every level, from, from the CEO talking to his employees to the one-on-one -on -one conversations you have you know, in, a, you know, in a performance evaluation to mm -hmm. these kind of outward public relations nightmares, if that's what they turn into, you, just, you, you cannot divulge enough information, in my opinion. Because everything, every, this conversation, where if I told you something right now, really pithy, that, you know, is it's going to be around the world here in about three seconds. Yeah. So the, the so power of the Internet and there's other, you know, there's other, I won't do that. No pressure. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> but the power of the net, the, this, this is connecting the entire planet right now. And yeah. within five years, you know, there'll be ways of every, in every culture, every part of the world, ways to get information instantaneously. Yeah. Well, I don't know if there's a rule, but I think there's an essential truth to transparency, which is you, you don't get to choose the only choice is whether you do it to yourself or you have somebody do it to right. you. <laughs> and when somebody does it to you, it won't feel so good. It doesn't feel good. <laughs> it doesn't feel good. And 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 I think that I think that Toyota was saying, well, what's the law? We, you know, we're getting this information out at the rate that the government is asking us to get it out, and they didn't realize that that's not what our expectation is anymore. Now our expectation as a consumer is, you tell us the minute you know something. Mm -hmm. Or we're not gonna, we're not gonna be big fans. Mm -hmm. Yeah.
That's a huge paradigm shift, though, wasn't? I mean, you're, you've been in business long enough to know that, like, you know, secrecy and intellectual property was all. Well, it seemed to be all that mattered, and it's almost like suddenly, within a very short period, it's flipped. Yeah, yeah, sure. I'm old enough to, have, you know, live to the Corvair Monza, and now, you know, having a Toyota Matrix that, you know, I just, they changed their approach to this in the last month. I got a, a letter after the first round of recalls saying, there's a recall coming. We, we're not sure exactly what it is, but it's coming. Mm -hmm. And then a month later, I got another letter. Okay, here's the recall. We know what it is now. It's, you know, go get this checked out. It's like, okay, but. That's a huge paradigm shift. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I, I just feel like, you know, as human, you know, literally as a human species, do we have to always look at the blaming part? And then you did this to me, and this happened. And you know what? How can we take a little bit of responsibility and help these companies instead of, you know, then dogpiling on them and saying they're all mm -hmm. bad and they did this mm -hmm. and they, you know, I think that that's yeah. something we have to look at because it's not, I don't think it's fair. They're human beings that work for that company. Yeah. They were, you know, making a great living. Now they're not. You know, a lot of them got laid off or whatever happened. And so how can we not just move to that blaming? And mm -hmm. actually do something, you know, not and, and, and that helps facilitate global change too, is just mm -hmm. shifting the way that we just, you know, look at one company that made a mistake and then we say they're all bad and they did this and that. And it, I just don't think that's fair. I think it's that, not at all fair because there are people, like you say, that lost their jobs, yet at the same time they were gagged mm -hmm. corporately. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right? They were told not to say anything. They probably would have liked to have said something. Right. They probably would have there were probably a lot of people there that said the rules aren't like this anymore. We should tell people right now. Right. And some of those same people may have lost their jobs or other people. And th it brings up something that I think is really I incredible about pa Patagonia is that ability to look at itself and have an open dialogue about what it wants to change. And I've seen that from Yvonne. I've seen it from you. How far down does that permeate into the corporation? Well, it goes, it goes top to bottom. Um, the, you know, an interesting thing that's happening to us right now on this whole topic is that as we get bigger, you know, we're likely to be in a range of $400 million at the end of this year. With our supply chain, you find yourself trying to manage and keep a tab on factories and workers all over the world. Mm -hmm. and so things, they, they go, if they go wrong, they go wrong faster and in a larger scale and more spread out geographically. Mm -hmm. An example would be, um, you know, if we sourced a, a button or a toggle for a, a, a zipper for a child's garment and that toggle wasn't exactly locked on perfectly. Yeah. Well, the minute we know that, and, and the things can go wrong. I mean, we don't know that that zipper might not be outsourced to another factory that we don't have a field auditor watching this. Right. So, so we get that toggle in and our first round assessment is that toggle can come off and the child could put it in their mouth and potentially choke on it. Well, we have to stop that that right at the factory, if any of you been shipped, we have to know where they were shipped, we have to just quarantine everything yeah. and go through every single box and look at it. Well, as the scale gets bigger, that's going on across 700 styles all over the world. It, it's hard to anticipate when something's gonna come bite you. You don't know. Well, what, so, so what happens? So everybody has to be invested in that, that you know, the mission statement, again, which is the first part is, you know, build the best product, yeah. cause no unnecessary harm. That's a sustainability part of the mission statement. But the best product means we don't sacrifice, we don't cut corners on anything we do. And that has, that's your whole approach to the business, how you image the brand and our catalogs and our website, um, the attention to detail on, on the auditing side, the attention to detail on designing a product so you don't, you know, make yourself don't expose yourself to any kind of quality problems down the road. And you, you can't anticipate everything. Something, things will go wrong. Yeah. But the, the ability for people to s say what they think within a corporation and then through the walls of a corporation can give it the soul that it typically lacks. And it's really important because they're very, corporations are very powerful individuals under the law mm -hmm. with limited liability. We don't want them to be soulless. Right. They're dangerous to be soulless. But many are but just because of the corporate structure we've mm -hmm. got. Mm -hmm. If I worked at Patagonia, I'll give you a hypothetical. If I worked in a factory, if I worked in one of the offices, and I noticed a zipper that was loose, you know, the toggle would come off, and I did a little video about it, and I posted it on YouTube, because I couldn't get my manager to listen. Do I get fired for that? Probably not. But maybe. No. No? 
That's Especially awesome. because that, you because think, you brought I, it to their attention yeah. first. And if you didn't get the response in, in our culture, we would reward that kind of entrepreneurial activism, mm -hmm. so to speak, and, and we'd like that. Yeah. We do have a, a culture that, that is uh, quite uh, robust and supported in terms of being able to speak out about things. Is there a way to teach that to other corporations through your work? Is that something that you, sure. that, that you can model and say, this is, because I think it's, to me, it seems critically important. I mean, what are the, you know, what are the attributes of a conscious capitalist co company or an enlightened leadership company? You know, mindfulness, thoughtfulness, caring, compassion, openness, um, all these things we've been talking about, these are attributes of companies that operate at a higher vibration. Mm -hmm. And so they allow uh, these kinds of exchanges to take place. And they can be heated, they can be argumentative, they can, but they can also be collaborative mm -hmm. too. And so if you have a culture that, that nurtures that kind of behavior and, that, and, and, and can reward it, frankly, um, you'll see more of it. Mm -hmm. If you have a culture that says it's not okay to go public with a product flaw or you know, um, something's wrong. Or even to speak off the masthead. You know, I think in most corporations, you, you are told with a mission statement or you know, a, an annual uh, mission primer, here's what's, here's what's, well, generally, probably most of you aren't allowed to say anything. And if you say anything, that's grounds for dismissal in most mm -hmm. corporate cultures. Um, but if you are allowed to say something, you've got a very specific sheet that you can speak from. And working in marketing, I've developed those sheets. You know, I know that tool because we've made it for people. Yeah, I, I always say it. At so Patagonia. I can talk off script. Yeah, at Patagonia. There, I was, there's a saying I always say about Patagonia. There are no secrets at Patagonia. Mm -hmm. there's, there's, the minute something comes to light, it's everywhere around that company. Again, it's that, go back to that collective consciousness. Yeah. But, but um, I don't uh, try to control any of the conversation that takes place within my team up to the founders of Ana Melinda Chenard. They know everything. Mm -hmm. they, they'll get an email. Someone will put a, a word in there about something that's going wrong possibly or hopefully right, but they know what's happening. Mm -hmm. And it's just the speed of communication within our company so fast that, that uh, there's no secrets. And I'm, I, I think that's a great way to run a company. And, and, and do you think it makes you more profitable? Do you think it makes you a, a more successful company? Because that's, that's how we'll get it into other See, the, 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 more, the more you try mm -hmm. to pave over the volcano and you know, hide it and throw dirt up on it, but pretty soon it's going to blow. And when it does blow, it's worse. And this yeah. is what just happened to, to Toyota, and we try to avoid those situations at Patagonia. Mm -hmm. It's pretty awesome. Um, who else does it? Who, what other corporate cultures do you oh, look we, at and say, wow, I'd like to model ourselves? I, I think a lot of companies have adopted this in recent years. I, I, I loved what Timberland did with their um, kind of nutritional hang tags. That they're you know, talking about the ingredients of their shoes and the footprint. Um, that was an outgrowth of some of the, the kind of work we did together through some of the um, outdoor industry organizations. Mm -hmm. and, and I, I call that lead and share. I mean, Timberland was really good at that. They developed these, these notions, but they didn't just keep them to themselves. They said, let's let others kind of take this idea and run with it as yeah. well. Um, Isn't that just crazy pants? I yeah. mean, that's the opposite of what we've mm -hmm. all learned. We've all been told to be I, secretive but this, IP. The, com yeah. the, the competitive nature of this is not something that there's always the, the product attributes and the product innovation that, that will kind of keep you ahead with yeah. that, that, you know, that unique selling proposition. This is not something that is really a competitive advantage. It's just what we need to do to be able to live on the planet for mm -hmm. a longer period of time and to have our children's children be able to do that. So that, to me, is it's not, it's not a, you know, it's not differentiation that it's going to propel you. It's like our, our environmentalism. Aren't you seeing a lot more collaboration, though, than, than yeah. in your time in business? I see. I, I do. I say collaboration is the new competition. I don't know what the mm -hmm. hell I mean by that. But there's something happening that's just fun. It's another fundamental shift. Don't where, you want to go to people who are good at things to help you create them mm -hmm. and, and bring them to your company as opposed to trying to beat your head up against the wall to figure it out yourself? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's like for us to do footwear, we tried to do footwear three times, and we finally went to a partner, Wolverine, that was good at making shoes. Yeah. And we want to really work closely and partner with them to do a better job of making sustainable footwear that looks good, that has a te technology story. There was a, there was a question um, tweeted in, going to some tweet questions, about, about uh, cotton. Or, or It wasn't cotton. It was, a, it was about um, a recycling goal for 2010. 
So the, the, the recycling goal for all of our fabrics, not just cotton, in, in 2010 was to get to 100% recyclability and recycled content. We got to about the 70% level, and we slowed down with some of the issues, like with luggage, there's rubber parts and there's metal parts and things like that that we had a very difficult time getting to that goal. Mm -hmm. We've reset the goal for 2015 to, to, keep, to try to get our entire product line out of the landfills. So landfill-free product line by 2015. And that'll be a difficult goal too, but we've, we've kind of opened up the criteria of how we can deal with, with, with our apparel, and that is to reuse, recycle, repurpose, resell, repair, and reimagine a world in which everything we take out of it, we are putting back into it. Mm. Kind of like the, you know, excuse my French, shit is food um, concept mm. of it, which, which, which uh, Gunther Pauli and others espouse. And, and it is um, that total nature of, of everything that falls off the tree under the ground, having you know, a, a new use in its new location is what we're, we're, we're going for. And I'm really excited about this because it just rebrands Common Threads and it makes it more robust as a, as a sustainable kind of underpinning from a strategic standpoint for Patagonia. And, and, and people didn't even know that you could, I've got questions here from people, they didn't even know you could recycle cotton. Yeah, you could chop it up and re-spin it and make it into garments that have a really neat kind of heather, heathered look. So you might have all different color t-shirts in, you know, in, you know, red and green and brown. It looks really fantastic. Yeah. And I actually didn't know you could do it. And you guys take Patagonia stuff back or are you, are you going to start to take? Well, I, I believe we're, we'll take uh, Patagonia stuff, organic cotton, you know, t-shirts and, and shorts and pants first. And then, uh, like we did with polyester garments and fleece garments, um, we, we were able to take it from our competitors, North Face, Marmot, and others. And as long as it was made by Malden Mills and then Polar Tech, we could take that polyester and grind it up and repurpose it into virgin polyester material again. And how would the, how would the used uh, uh, piece work? Are you thinking Just as good as the, it, 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 it reconstitutes, it's chemically and, and uh, forcibly recycled through grinding process into and then melted down into virgin pellets. You can't tell the difference. Hmm. So it, it looks, feels, and, and performs when it's made just like a regular garment because we're taking it back to that original polyester right. pellet, that raw right. material. Right. And what, what, I was, what I was getting at was you'd mentioned um, uh, used garments. Were you at retail used garments? Or well, not? retail, so with used garments, um, we know that there's a way to you know, the Salvation Army and other stores and consignment yeah. stores do a great job with Patagonia gear because it lasts so dang long yeah. that we want to encourage that behavior. Okay. But I, I can't really speak to um, what's going to happen, but I think there's some obvious potential for online resellers to get involved Okay. with helping us, you know, find a market for secondary goods. Somebody's looking for an old retro fleece jacket that's, you know, vintage 19, you know, 87, mm -hmm. they'll go get it. Instead of it just getting thrown away, yeah. they'll say, hey, I want that jacket. Well, and also, if you have Patagonia stuff, you can, send it, you can send it in, right? And you guys do repairs, which is one of the great things about Patagonia. Yeah. Um, but uh, but uh, so if you had a, a used aspect of the, some of those clothes that people send in, repaired by Patagonia, and, but, you know, it's 10 years old, it's 15 years old. Well, I mean, one of the miserable things about Patagonia is it never wears out, right? Sorry. Well, <laughs> no, I know it's 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 an but in a way it can be like this thing is still good, damn it, you know. Like I want a new thing. So, so don't buy a new thing. So you don't. No. But, but maybe if I could throw it into a system where I can get a different old thing. I, I remember a catalog that you guys did years and years ago, maybe before you got there, and it said if you own something in a category, don't get another one. Yvonne said that. Said why do you need another jacket or a shirt? I, and he, I didn't like buy a lot of us, anything he... from Patagonia for like seven years after that. Okay. And 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 what was crazy though is I bought from other people. Like yeah. so, I'd get some from Marmot because they hadn't told me that. Um, well, we tried the reverse psychology, and you're obviously I loved not, you the not most. that childlike. I so we, we thought you would have just got a credit worked. card. It should have worked on me. I looked in literally. my closet just two days ago. I was out in Ventura at the office, and I looked at it the weekend before in Colorado. I have enough shoes and apparel. To last me the rest of my life. I mean, it's just crazy. Yeah. So what am I going to make as a company that's going to, you know, that you need to go buy just to market? You could get through the apocalypse and what you're wearing right now, maybe with a heavier jacket and a hat or something, but you'll yeah. be fine. 
Well, those thin, I mean, you had one on when you came in. Those thin down yeah, sweaters. Those are sweet. Those mm -hmm. are so sweet. Yeah. Nano puffs and down sweaters. You got, if action. you don't own one of those things, this shouldn't turn into a product placement commercial, but it will transform your life. I'm, I shit you not. Pearl that, Street Mall in Boulder, head on down, right? And now. well, and then this isn't you guys, but smart wool socks. When, when I Beautiful. had to evacuate for the fires three times this year, um, Smart Wolf socks made the cut, and those Patagonia sweaters made the cut. It's, that's all you need. You know? Fantastic. Yeah. 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 Um, are you guys doing stuff with wool? Because wool's mm -hmm. pretty interesting. How that's coming on as a. As, uh, it's as a really. It's, it's the most. It's been the, the the you know the the fiber of choice for so long, and, and we're doing a lot of work with blended um, wool, merino wool blended with our Kaplan polyester, mm -hmm. which is a nice kind of combination. It kind of holds the shape of the garment. Um, I'm modeling one right now. Yeah. Oh, that's, is that yeah. kind of good? Yeah, <laughs> and it's, it's really got a nice feel and look to it. I, lo I love it. Yeah. And we use it in everything from activity-based, you know, fast action sports to, as you can see, beautiful sweaters. Well, what people may not re realize that I've discovered about wool, it's embarrassing to say, but it doesn't smell. Like mm -hmm. it, you can wear the same socks like day after day. Not that I ever would I know do you such wouldn't a do thing. That. No. no. But say you had to. <laughs> And and they just stay nice. They stay fresh. It's like it's like nature's Febreze built in to a wool garment. It's a good thing. What's the what's the big challenge for you and for other corporations out there right now? Well, it, it's always a challenge. Is where do you spend your resources? You know, and then focusing in on the things that are really meaningful to to, to get the brand uh, continuing to grow. And um, I, I think the space, the the web space, and e-commerce and that whole area is really a fantastic opportunity for us. I, I don't see us having many challenges because we've really fixed our supply chain and we're delivering on time and our quality is good. But I, I, I see the web in its current situation as being this kind of hub for all branded communication for Patagonia. Driving re retail store traffic, you know, having product launches that you know, are exclusive to us on the web, um, you know, bringing in other kind of storytelling elements into mm. the web so we enhance the brand and talk about what our, our athletes are doing and you know there's so much there to work on so I'm, I'm really excited about that 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 opportunity and, and and we're seeing that the web is actually helping us um, you know bring people to our stores because it's really lovely to go to our store and meet with our clerks and our sales associates and try a garment on and kind of learn what's going on in the community we have slideshows we have speaker events and so it's part of building that tribe mm -hmm. of, of patagonia loyalists on a global basis how do you stay on mission so not for the next five years or for the next how do you stay on mission for the next 50 years you know ben and jerry's is one of those companies that i think also pioneered this space but it's a little tragic um, what's happened. Mm. Um, and, uh, you know, Ben is not there and he's not entirely happy with some of the things that they do and some of their policies. Um, and it, it, it's, it was, it's almost, it feels almost inevitable with a certain amount of scale, there's a transformation that, that takes place. And there's a lot of people doing a lot of work to figure out how that doesn't have to be. Right. And you guys must be thinking about that. Yeah, I, I, I think that the, the key for us is that um, the founders, Yvonne and Melinda Chenard, want to keep the company private. And it's likely that it will pass on to their, their daughter and son, mm -hmm. Claire and Fletcher. And Claire is a designer working inside the company now, a lifestyle designer, does beautiful clothing. And Fletcher's driving the surf initiative. He's hand-shaping surfboards. So you have to have a succession plan in place that keeps, can allow it to keep, keep private with the fundamental mission intact. I will also say that, that the, um, the thing that's happening with Patagonia as it's becoming bigger, it has crossed that, culture, crossed that cultural chasm, so to speak, of being this niche cult brand mm -hmm. to being a mainstream brand, but I think we maintain all the authenticity around it, and that's what we work very hard to do. That the athletes we work with, the way we image ourselves, the way we control our story on the web, um, we're not a mass market communicator via yeah. you know, advertising and Bus, the you know, buses and stuff, yeah, <laughs> TVs, advertising, yeah. Um, that we just keep it pure, keep yeah. it, you know, ourselves keep it private. So how, so private is a great answer, mm -hmm. and that is tended to work. Is there an answer that's within the scope of, scope of public companies? Because a lot of people feel like if we don't solve public companies, then we won't solve anything. Yeah, I, I can't speak to the public companies. I think they have some, they have some challenges. 
uh, ahead of them, and, and every company does. But you, you've got to just stick to your knitting. You've got to make the business successful. Um, for us, it's about you know growing, staying profitable, not growing for growth's sake, trying to keep the growth natural and sustainable within our channels, mm -hmm. and and proving that the model works by but being you don't profitable. Have that corporate pressure coming from no. shareholders mm -hmm. who are. Potentially <coughs> holding on to your stock for all of several seconds, yet insisting on a very short-term turn, turnaround for their money. Well, the pressure for us, frankly, is is staying profitable. To show that this model of Keep being a, a mm -hmm. green, sustainable company with a great you know, social mindedness can be successful. If we failed, who else would want to try to be like Patagonia? Yeah. Oh, Patagonia went out of business. They, that, they couldn't make it work, so we shouldn't yeah. try to do that. And everyone would say that, too. I would that's think they why would, it's they would love tool. to jump on our, dance on our graves if that yeah. happened, but we were not let, letting them do that. We're yeah. even more profitable now than we've ever been. Yeah. yeah I think it's so important that, that just to share best practices because that's what, I mean, Casey looks forward to that, to help other corporate leaders. And again, it, it starts with the happy part. Like, mm -hmm. are you a happy person? Do you go to work every day and you've got all these issues in your life that prevent you from actually putting your best foot forward? Right. And so that's like the very seed of it. And we talk a lot about it as, you know, if we're having challenges in our relationship, <coughs> how's he going to work? You know, because it, it's so important to have your home life with your kids and your family just be really intact. And that's, I think, a lot of those, we were in, down on Wall Street and it was funny, we were talking to this guy and you're saying that this is the very seed of a, a successful company is the relationships, you know, at home. And he said, where were you when my wife and I were splitting up? <laughs> you know, he said, because he was really struggling because his job demanded him to be there all the time. Yeah. And so... Or you think it does. You well, you so think it does. Yeah, you get, you get... You ought to know. Right, right. I do know. Yeah. I do know. And you feel like of all the commitments that you've got, the ones, and, and the, the structure convinces you that, like, don't break that commitment to that, you know, person and that right. meeting. And, and meanwhile, it's like, oh, I forgot to show up for my daughter's recital or right. couldn't show up, right? right? right. What do you, mm -hmm. it, it, but you, it's so ingrained in our process and that sort of military uh, indoctrination to business mm -hmm. that it's really difficult. Mm -hmm. What if I'm a person and I'm out there and I want to, you know, Al Gore said, yeah, you can, you know, people can, can be trained to give his presentation. Is there a way through what you're doing where I could, in my little company of eight or ten people, I could give the Patagonia presentation that you share with people like Walmart? Sure. There is. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, the, the, the principles aren't that, 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 you know, obtuse or crazy. They're, they're, they're pretty basic. The Patagonia corporate infection is something that we really want. We want to inject your, you know, right we want your, to, yeah. yeah. We yeah. want to spread rapidly. Yeah, yeah, and you know this, I think a couple things. This uh, Chip Connolly, who it's jo Joie de Vie, he does, he started this boutique hotel, hotel chain. chain. Mm -hmm. He's an amazing leader and he uh, was host of this, it's um, Enlightened, Enlightened Business Leadership. Summit, mm -hmm. in, in, Enlightened Business Leadership. And there are a collective, and that's this conscious global leadership that we're doing. It's, it is getting all these leaders together to share best practices with other leaders. Mm -hmm. And so when, once you start doing that, because Casey always says, that's you know, when exploding. you're... exploding. I mean, it seems like every that, week yeah. I see a different conference like that. Yeah, there, that yeah. Is, and it I should be just a... frontier right now. I mean, it's, yeah. it's what, uh, you know, John Mackey, who's the CEO of Whole Foods, kind of kick-started this whole conscious capitalism alliance. And, and it, the first was it was giving business leaders, CEOs and presidents some, some support and some license to come meet as a group and talk about these things. Yeah. How you know, a, a company can be run more mindfully and how you take care of your employees and how you communicate this and how you do this without some fear of being some freak yeah. that, you know, that you know, is you know, throwing the I Ching it is, and it is, sitting it is. in the lotus position in the corporate office. But the freak thing is <laughs> you don't want to be uh, cast as a hippie. And you, know, mm -hmm. you, you use the term love. I would sign off a lot of corporate communications with love. And it, it, it was hard. Almost every time I'd put it in, it felt kind of awkward. But yeah. you're like, but that's kind of what true. I mean. It's kind of changing. And, yeah. and it's not that... It's just that it, you can use a lot of words, you know, treating your employees with respect. I know at Patagonia what it means because we have a family and we love one another, okay? Yeah. 
and, the, and we support one another. When we're at our best when times are tough, when there's, you know, there's a death in someone's family or you know, there's been some tragedy. We lose athletes because they're extreme athletes, and that is really tough on the culture. But we get through it because everyone supports one another. Yeah. And, and it, you know, it's really, to me, it's about asking those hard questions. What do you really want? You know, how do you want to be treated? Um, you know, a lot of Walmart's transformation began with Katrina, right? Yeah. From what I've heard. Mm -hmm. in, in the same mm -hmm. way, you know, they, they, they galvanized around, well, what should we just do? And they didn't ask anyone. They just went and they brought water and they made a difference and they diverted trucks to, to where they needed to go. And, you know, FEMA couldn't figure it out. And Walmart, well, we'll get this. We'll get this one. Yeah. And from that moment, mm -hmm. it transformed them. You know? That's awesome. I think I think we're running out. So there's people waving at me, like we're we're starting to starting to run out. Are we gonna run the jingle? Isn't the jingle time? Yeah. It, it, we, support. Are you gonna it's, support it, your sponsors? At some at some point, <laughs> we have we have three minutes. Is there something that uh, that you wanna that you really wanna get people to look at that you're doing or share with you or or just an idea that you wanna. Get out there. Oh, that kind of caught me by surprise. Uh, God, only one question caught you by surprise. Prompt, That's not me, bad. prompt me on that one. I, I, uh, well, I, I think back to this, this movement of conscious capitalism. What I wanted to say is that um, I think you know, being CEO of a company can be a very tough deal. It's a, it's a lonely world. You, there's a lot of pressure, a lot of responsibility. Um, and, and, and various you know, CEOs you know, adapt to it in different ways. But what's, what's comforting about this, the, the Conscious Capitalism Alliance and this movement towards enlightened leadership is that there's the ability to speak with other people who are leaders of company and, and, sh and share some of those issues that confront you and, mm -hmm. and, and realize that there are different ways to go about bringing the company to success that, that is new. For, for American corporate culture. And I mentioned some of those names of people that are, are working on this. And what commonly comes out is that a lot of business leaders are miserable. They're lonely, they're miserable, mm -hmm. their health is failing, they're not happy, and they have to have, they generally have a wake up call. They either have a heart a attack, heart attack yeah. or they have a divorce, or a, ch a child passes away. Something happens that mm -hmm. wakes them up to go, oh, there's more to life than just you know, beating the bottom line every year and making a yeah. big bonus. And when they have that realization, then they, sometimes they go into a personal practice. Most of them do. They go through this transformation, mm -hmm. whether it's yoga and meditation and exercise and you know, you know, having a divine presence that they bring in to help them through these situations and then just showing huge gratitude for every, all the abundance that they have in their life. Because a lot of these guys are wealthy, but they're just not enjoying their money. So uh, It could be the upside <laughs> of the industrial food crisis is that yeah. all leaders are about to have heart attacks. They'll all go through this process, and they will transform their company. And what happens is that's a horrible scenario. But, I, but I, wish that I, I look at it in a more <laughs> uplifting way to say that they will come out at some point. They will come out and reveal that that they have been through this crisis. Yeah. And it's okay. And yeah. they'll have they'll see commonality from their fellow CEOs going, Yeah. yeah I went through that too. Yeah. Boy, did I go through that? Yeah. And then they'll they'll find a new way of conducting business that will make them happier and will make their company happier, and I think more successful. And that is the conscious business model that Tara and I are talking about, this global conscious leadership opportunity that will make companies more successful and their leaders happier and their employers happier because they're feeling that love from top to bottom. But yeah. there's still a lot of you know, getting around what we're talking about here, which is you know, uh, love, respect, compassion, mindfulness, thoughtfulness. Those, that's not the traditional way Americans do business. Yeah. It's crushing the competition. There's been a lot of greed. There's been a lot of malfeasance. There's been a lot of things that have cycled through the economic sector in the last few years, and yeah. we saw the result of it. It was a global economic crisis. Generosity is the new greed. Everything's like go go 180 from yeah. how you used to behave. Exactly. And it really and it really is um, it is greedy to be generous because it's so much more fulfilling, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. That's why I think we're going to come out of this this recession a much healthier business environment. I've never been worried about Patagonia, but I'm more bullish than ever <laughs> after uh, after sitting with you. And it was good to see you again. Go to Patagonia.com. Been too long. Just buy one item for the next. 10 Go years. to Patagonia.com. I will. I will support the effort, and I'll, I'll look for some used stuff on there. Please. As well. Thank you. Awesome. Great Patagonia. talking to you. Yeah. Great seeing you again. Thanks. Thanks so much. Absolutely. Yeah. That was fun. Now is when we usually like sort of go wide and pretend to talk.
To the fire, shoot the breeze, discourse, dialogue. Bring to light to be revealed with eloquence, forever flowing, fearless. You guys let me know when we're off air.